G'day, chaps. Tis I, Clumpunger 139. After correcting fools on their terrible takes of Arkham Knight, I only found it right to do their job better than them and sin the game myself. And that's it. Here's everything actually wrong with Batman Arkham Knight. Let's rip the most obvious band-aid off right away. The Batmobile. Do not close this video, I swear to God. I am a Batmobile defender. I think I've made that abundantly clear by now. I think it's a lot of fun and enjoy its inclusion very, very much. That does not mean it was handled as well as it could have been. There's a reason people always harp on the game for having too much Batmobile, and I'm here to break it down. Let's go over the positives first. It controls like a dream. For being Rocksteady's only attempt at making a drivable vehicle so far, it's amazing how good it feels to drive. It strikes the perfect balance of feeling heavy but smooth at the same time, speeding through the streets of Gotham, crushing lamp posts and small buildings in your path, and drifting around tight corners while chasing down thugs feels amazing. And the tank combat feels just as good. It also feels heavy, but the 360 degrees of freedom combined with the boost mechanic all feel amazing. And despite playing on a controller, aiming always felt good and responsive and the risk-reward system of building up the weapons generator by taking down drones to unleash powerful attacks but risk losing it all to a single hit is really fun to take advantage of. For what they wanted to accomplish with the Batmobile, they did absolutely incredible. The core concepts behind the Batmobile are all incredibly solid and make for fun a gameplay experience in and of themselves. However, where the Batmobile fails and why so many people dislike its inclusion is in what they use these positive qualities for. The math may be true. You may spend less than 20% of completing the game actually in the Batmobile, as found by that boy Aqua. But that doesn't matter when the gameplay in question is not good. Driving is fantastic, as I just said. Speeding through the streets of Gotham in a nearly impenetrable tank of a car is fantastic and honestly would have been enough to make the Batmobile worth it in Arkham Knight. Where it falls short is everywhere else. Take this puzzle section from the Arkham Knight HQ. You have to constantly go back and forth, in and out of the Batmobile, all the while waiting as it slowly makes its way down the wall. All to end the section by slowly turning this drill for nearly a full minute by just holding down on the control stick. This isn't fun or even puzzling. Compare that to this section in the movie studios where you don't have the Batmobile. You have to grapple up to this vent, move out of sight of the minigunner, pull out the voice synthesizer, and use it to move him closer to the wall to blow him up after priming it with explosive gel. You did so much more in the movie studios in a much shorter amount of time and with considerably more effort and critical thinking. In the Batmobile, all you can do is use the power winch and shoot things. There's very little critical thinking required for the Batmobile puzzles compared to the basic on-foot puzzles. And the problem is that a lot of puzzles in the main story of Arkham Knight require the Batmobile to some degree. I will admit, Riddler's puzzles get you thinking quite a bit more, but not nearly as much as base Batman with his much wider moveset. And all of this is without discussing the tank battles. Again, I am a defender of these battles. I personally think they're a lot of fun and clearly had a lot of thought and care put into them with an incredibly unique battle system. The problem isn't the amount of time spent in the Batmobile, it's the number of times you use it. I did some counting, and Arkham Knight has about 23 regular combat encounters, 13 predator encounters, and at least 20 required tank fights throughout the main story. For comparison, Arkham City has about 15 each of combat and predator encounters, in a game about half the length. All these are static, forced encounters that you must face to progress in the main story, with a considerable number of enemies that actually take some effort to fight. This isn't taking side missions into account, or sections with two enemies you can instantly use a double takedown on. These are encounters absolutely required to progress the main story, and only the main story. The simple fact that tank combat in Arkham Knight overshadows predator combat and nearly overtakes hand-to-hand -hand combat is not a good thing. More on this a little later. Now I see a lot of people pointing to that boy Aqua's video defending Arkham Knight when talking about the Batmobile. You should watch it, it's a good video. In it, as mentioned earlier, he found that you only spend about 19% of the game actually in the Batmobile. 
What people fail to realize is that that number is for his 100% completion over the course of 20 hours. That's all well and good, but take into account how much more time that is compared to just the main story, which is what a lot of reviewers tend to base their opinions off of and what I'm talking about here. Now, while collecting footage for this video, I only played the main story, plus a few quick side missions for the necessary footage, and managed to beat it with all cutscenes in 7 hours and 39 minutes. Removing all the cutscenes, dialogue, side quests, and failed attempts from the footage leaves us with approximately 4 hours and 13 minutes of pure main story gameplay footage. I say approximately because I wasn't super thorough when going through all the footage, I just looked for any non-gameplay slash main story stuff and cut it. Anyway, throughout all that footage, approximately 1 hour and 12 minutes were spent in the Batmobile. That's not including all the time you spend trying to make a path for the Batmobile and leaving it, like for most of the subway section during City of Fear or the entire Night HQ. This is only time spent behind the wheel of the Batmobile. Meaning, even as a pseudo-speedrunner playing the game more optimally than most players, I still spent approximately 28% or more than a quarter of my gameplay in the Batmobile. Again, excluding times, you're just trying to get the Batmobile access to something. If you included those, the time would probably jump up at least another 5 minutes, raising the percentage to 30. True, it's not the 60 or 75 percent many reviewers made it out to be, but it's still a lot of gameplay. The point I'm trying to make here is that there's less Batmobile than people expect in Arkham Knight, but there's a reason so many people think the game has too much of the Batmobile. 1.5 million people have watched That Boy Aqua's video on Arkham Knight, meaning at least half a million watch the Batmobile section and know that it's in less than 20% of the game, given click-through rates on YouTube. Yet, just as many people still say the Batmobile was overused, and I'm trying to dissect why. And I think it all ties back to the encounters I mentioned earlier. There are a lot of tank combat encounters. Nobody can deny that fact because it's the same or greater for every player. Every player will fight approximately 20 hordes of tanks, 23 thug groups hand to hand, and 13 groups of armed thugs. Again, this is taking into account decently sized groups of enemies that take some effort to take out. There's no encounters counted here where you can just blow up 3 tanks in quick succession and keep driving, or do a fear multi takedown to remove all the thugs instantly. These all take some amount of time and effort to complete. And that's where the problem lies. These tank battles take up a bunch of encounters that could be dedicated to the gameplay styles we've grown to love for the past three games. The developers put so much effort into improving the already nearly perfect combat and predator mechanics of the previous games. Combat is so freaking good in Arkham Knight, it's honestly mind-blowing how they were able to pull it off. All the flow of the previous games was somehow improved upon to create arguably the best melee combat system in any game ever made all while adding new and expanding upon old mechanics in ways I'm sure none of us saw coming. Enemies now charge at you, but you can instantly take them down with a batarang. Quickfire gadgets now have upgraded combo versions that ramp up your damage and encourage you to use new combos. And enemies have so many ways to block punches, forcing you to get creative with your attacks instead of just rhythmically spamming X. And Predator was ramped up so much with so many new mechanics that it's basically a shadow of its former self. You have so many tools at your disposal, but so do the enemies, as they adapt to your tactics with thermal charges, mind vantage points, tracking your detective vision, and learning about your moves from their commander. All the while, you can go absolutely ham on them with fear multi-takedowns, exploding generators with a remote hacking device, and disrupting their guns to explode in their hands. Or use qu classic quiet tactics that have been significantly improved upon, like being able to silent takedown from basically any location, even while on vantage points or over ledges. You have so many options, I'm pretty sure I still haven't even used all of them yet. Both of these systems were improved so much from the previous games, and yet you don't get to see them in their full capacity because of the goddamn tanks. In comparison to the wide variety you have with Combat and Predator, tank battles are really, really shallow. You have one way to win any and all tank battles, blow up all the tanks. And how do you go about that? By aiming at the turret and shooting. Sometimes you'll have to shoot down some missiles with your Vulcan gun, but then it's right back to shooting the turrets. 
Oh, there's cobras in the area, sneak around them with your literally perfect radar, shoot a tracking shot to distract them, wait for the gun to calibrate, and blow them up with a single shot. Oh, you built up the weapons generator? Spam X for an instant win button against 10 tanks, use an EMP or take control of some of them yourself, then go right back to shooting. Oh, a twin rattler is aiming right at you? Press A for a quick dodge, then go right back to shooting, if you ever even stopped. Oh, your 60mm cannon is reloading? Start praying to RNGesus Jesus that your Vulcan gun gets an instant kill on one of the tank's sensor arrays. There's so little depth to tank combat when compared to the crazy dynamics you have in hand-to-hand -hand and predator combat. You just blow them all up. There's so little depth to the weapons generator compared to the combo attacks of hand-to-hand. -hand. I mean, you have the basic combo takedown, which is a quick and reliable instant takedown for early in the game, great for dealing with annoying enemies. The multi-round takedown, which is invaluable for speedrunners thanks to instantly knocking out any downed enemy that combos w with itself very well, especially when you have the upgraded free flow meter. Disarm and Destroy is great for getting rid of annoying weapons like shields and stun sticks, but doesn't deal any damage to enemies, so you have to build up more combos. The Combo Backclaw is literally just an upgraded combo takedown, but is very expensive and super useful the more you play, since it can take out brutes instantly. The Combo Freeze Blast freezes multiple enemies solid, letting you take a lot of heat off yourself. And Combo Explosive Gel, Batarangs, and Wreck Gun all do damage to stun multiple enemies at once giving you great coverage when you're normally in a single hit scenario. All these add a lot of depth to the combat, compared to the weapons generator which just... doesn't. You can blow up a lot of tanks really quickly, temporarily shut a few down, or turn some to your side. And that's it. Sure, they're useful, no doubt about that, but combat hardly changes with or without their inclusion because you already have an instant knockdown option in the form of the Vulcan gun. With a well-placed shot to the sensor array, you can instantly destroy any and all tanks. Yes, it's difficult to do, but so is building up enough weapons energy for a 10-missile strike. The AMP is only as useful as how much you build it up. At level 1, it'll barely have any range and disable drones for like 5 seconds or less. And let's be honest, even if you do build it all the way up to level 4, in what world are you going to have 10 or more tanks perfectly surrounding you to get hit by that EMP blast? And in what world is temporarily disabling them going to be better than destroying them with the missile strike? The CPU virus is definitely the most interesting and potentially most useful since you can hack multiple drones depending on how high you charge. If you can get lucky, hacking a Twin Rattler, Mamba, Diamondback, and Dragon will let you do some serious damage. Twin Rattlers can do the most damage the fastest, Mambas can do the most damage period with the missiles, Diamondbacks are the bulkiest while also having a good bullet spread, and Dragons are flying which take the drone's attention to the skies and away from you for a little bit. However, the likelihood of that happening instead of just hacking 4 basic Rattlers is really unlikely, because the hack is an all or nothing use similar to the EMP. Whatever 4 drones are the closest at the time you use it are the ones you'll take over. And aside from that first drone you aim at, you have no agency as far as which ones you'll hack. All of these abilities are ultimately good in concept, but don't add anything like the combos of hand-to-hand -hand combat do. As a whole, tank battles just rely a lot less on critical thinking and more on spectacle. Like, wow, isn't it cool how you just blew up 62 tanks almost entirely by yourself and saved an entire police precinct? Yeah, but I didn't really have to think more than aim at the shooty things and move away from the red lines. That's all tank combat is. Ultimately, tank combat isn't inherently bad. Like I've said multiple times now, I love it and think it's a lot of fun. The math proves that you don't spend that much time actually in the Batmobile and people were clearly overreacting. The problem is that the tank gameplay is too shallow in comparison to the incredibly dynamic combat and predator gameplay and the game just uses it a few too many times. 20 tank encounters compared to 23 combat and only 13 predator encounters is just too much for such shallow gameplay. If any of them felt different from the last, maybe we wouldn't all be complaining so much. I think I've been on this point long enough. It's literally been over 5 pages of the script so far. But feel free to debate this all you want in the comments. They're good for me anyway. On to a more widely accepted problem with Knight, and something that especially affects me as a content creator, 
the hologram calls. These calls slow down the game so much that it makes repeat playthroughs almost unbearable. The fact that Batman just has to use his hologram phone for every tiny conversation he has with Oracle, Lucius, or Alfred is just annoying. They could have easily made it so the screen showed up in the corner while you were driving or gliding around Gotham and save the handheld conversations for big story moments, like when Batman is confronting Scarecrow in the airships, or when he's about to repair the Batmobile during City of Fear. But no, they had to have it for every little encounter with Batman's allies, and slow the pace of the game down to that of a snail. It's really bad and always ruins repeat playthroughs for me when I just need gameplay footage. The Bosses Good lord, the bosses of Arkham Knight are terrible. At least, the main story bosses. The side missions have some pretty good bosses. Pig, Riddler, and Man Bat are coming to mind. But the main game only has a single competent boss in Jason. Sure, there's other okay fights. Albert King, The Excavator, and Johnny Charisma are... there. They're nowhere near any of the bosses of City and Origins. And then you've got The Cloudburst, Firefly, Jason's Chopper, and Deathstroke, easily some of the worst bosses in the series, and doing a massive disservice to the characters behind them. I won't say Knight has the overall worst bosses in the series, I think that goes to Asylum, but it's definitely the most disappointing when compared to its brethren especially since Asylum's bosses were a last-minute addition and Knights were clearly planned out and meant to be there from the start. There's a bit to think about with Barbara's At a glance, it doesn't really make sense. How does Scarecrow know what Batman sees? Well, let's think about how Scarecrow, and by extension Fear Toxin, actually works. He doesn't just gas people and leave them be. He manipulates the situation to his liking so they experience the fear he wants. And when his subjects resist, or are afraid of something he isn't expecting, he freaks out. So, how did he manipulate this situation against Batman to know exactly what he was seeing? Well, he did gas Batman moments before any of this happened in the airships. Then he showed Batman a video of Barbara in the gas chamber. I have little doubt that Barbara is actually in the chamber here, since Alfred acknowledges the situation as well. Therefore, Batman would see Barbara in the chamber under the effects of fear toxin thus making him see her in the chamber when he arrives because that's his greatest fear in the moment. Furthermore, Barbara's wheelchair specifically is actually in the chamber. Going back later in the story when the chair is empty shows that it is Barbara's wheelchair and not just some generic one like she's in on the rooftop encounter with Scarecrow. Notice the backpack on the back of the one in the chamber and the lack of backpack here. This would further convince Batman that she's actually in the chamber. Scarecrow would know this, but how would he know what goes on when Batman actually arrives? Well, we can see he doesn't actually acknowledge Barbara being in the chamber until Batman himself calls out to her. Meaning, he was waiting for Batman to give him the cue to start talking and manipulating. What's happening? Barbara! Yes, you see it now. The horror behind the glass. No. The monster that will be your end. He then tells Barbara to pick up a gun that isn't actually there. We know it's not there, both because Joker slides it over to her, and because it wasn't on the table when Scarecrow recorded her in the chamber initially. See, it's not on the table here. However, aside from that, the scene kind of makes sense. Scarecrow doesn't say anything until Barbara shoots herself, meaning he's letting Batman's mind do the work for him. When we exit the first person perspective, we see Batman is already on his knees, meaning that's probably how Scarecrow knew Barbara shot herself. Batman probably had a look of shock and fell to his knees when it happened, and Scarecrow took that as his cue that his plan to break him worked. Really, the only problem with this scene is that there was never a gun to begin with, and that breaks things more than just a little. Not only is Scarecrow being presumptuous that there's even a gun in the chamber for not Barbara to use, but there's also permanent bullet holes in the glass here. Even after the body goes missing, and Batman regains control of his mind, these bullet holes are still in the glass. Meaning, they're a real thing that isn't just a manifestation of fear. Which means either the devs forgot to remove them when they removed Barbara's body, or there was actually someone in here shooting at Batman who shot themselves. And there was indeed a gun. But then, who would have gone out of their way to remove the body, when body disposal is clearly not on the malicious priority list? 
Given all the information, this is how I assumed it all happened. Barbara was in the chamber when Scarecrow broadcast the video to Batman. Since he was recently affected by fear gas, he would see it when he finally reached the penthouse. The militia left the wheelchair in the chamber, but replaced Barbara with some random person, militia member or otherwise. This random person shot at Batman, leaving the bullet holes in the glass, and eventually shot themselves at Scarecrow's insistence. The militia later went to retrieve the body, but left the wheelchair for one reason or another. It's definitely not the best excuse, but it's really the only way these events could play out that makes sense. If any of you have some idea of a way this scene could play out that makes more sense, please let me know, because for right now, this is another mistake I can't really find a super logical explanation for. Hush. Yeah, that's all there is to say about that. See other people breaking down why he sucks. I'm not going to steal their words. For the most part, the DLC stories are not good. Remember back in Arkham City and Origins when a single DLC story would last you at least 45 minutes to an hour, and the cost of those stories was the same as each 10 minute story of night? It's bad. I was lucky to get the season pass for a mere 4 bucks because I would not have been happy spending much more on the lackluster content I got. Matter of Family and Season of Infamy are great, but the others just don't give enough content. It's not terrible content, far from it, but it's mostly really mediocre when compared to the incredible Cold Cold Heart and Harley Quinn's Revenge. All of them are way too short. Nightwings is incredibly lazy, reusing the location from the base game's finale. Robin had the potential for a great subplot of feeling inferior, but just didn't feel like expanding upon it. Catwoman's was way too hard. Red Hood's was even shorter than the already short ones. And Harley's... Well, there's nothing inherently wrong with hers, but I'm not a big fan of playing as her, so there's that. Again, Season of Infamy and Matter of Family are great, but the rest are just so... as a Morton Joe would put it. What do I say about Joker? On the one hand, it's not great that Rocksteady brought him back. Not only after killing him off in one of the best scenes in gaming history, but also after Origins was marketed to not have him at all and also lied about it. He's stuck deep inside you. In many ways, Joker feels like a crutch for the writers trying to make up for their mediocre scarecrow. More on that later. Oh, I know. When you're done, let's hack his online dating profile. But on the other hand, it's Mark Hamill reprising his role once again, absolutely giving it his all in probably the best Joker performance in the series. Take me on home to the asylum. Meanwhile, giving one of the most interesting Batman Joker dynamics in this series. So you finally lost it, eh? Finally snapped my neck. <laughs> I've got a whole breakdown of it and why it's brilliant, so I'll leave you to that if you wish. News flash! You killed me! Ultimately, it's a double-edged sword. Joker's inclusion should feel lazy, but he's arguably the best part of Arkham Knight at the same time. The writers clearly put their best foot forward with Joker while dropping the ball on basically everyone else. So, should that be a sin towards Joker or everyone else? Frankly, I'm not sure. Oh, bats! Deathstroke. Yep, that's all there is to say about that. The Glitches. By god, this game is so glitchy. And I'm not even talking about the terrible PC port. That's a topic for someone else to talk about. I'm talking about all the ridiculous glitches still present in the game today. I have yet to have a single play session where my game didn't crash. Every single time I play through Arkham Knight, I will be guaranteed a crash at least once. And if the game isn't crashing, ragdolls are spazzing out on the floor, enemies are infinitely dancing, or Batman and co will engage in some casual telekinesis. It's really something to behold at times. 
It isn't quite as bad as Arkham Origins, but it's still one of the most bug-ridden games I've played to this day. It definitely needed at least one more go through the polisher. Alright, let's finally rip the other band-aid off. Scarecrow got absolutely shafted in this game. Let me go, or she dies. All the trailers spent forever building up Scarecrow's return after six years of hatred and intricate planning. We were ready to see what Scarecrow was willing to do to get his revenge. And don't get me wrong, the stuff we actually get with Scarecrow is honestly masterful. Do you know what happens when a man refuses to be controlled by his fears? He must face them. His monologues are some of the biggest highlights of this game as they convey a man with power over Batman. The problem is that he barely does anything. In a main story that takes roughly 8 hours, assuming the player watched all cutscenes and played somewhat optimally, Scarecrow has about 20 minutes of screen time. That's it. That is only 4% of the game. Compare that to Joker from Arkham City, a game that takes roughly 5 hours under the same circumstances, and Joker has over half an hour of screen time. In a game where he technically isn't even the main villain. That's at least 10% of the game. Relative to the size of the game, Joker has double the screen time in Arkham City than Scarecrow does in Night. That would be like Joker having only 12 minutes of screen time in City. That is an embarrassment to your main villain. Again, Scarecrow's scenes are amazing. His confrontation of Gordon on the rooftop is honestly masterful, and it shows how much control he has over his situation, and how powerful fear truly is in the hands of someone who knows how to control it. He's scary, as someone with scare in his name should be. He is a great villain and a great threat in this game, but he barely gets a chance to show it because the writers just decide to throw him to the side. Our first priority of the game is finding Scarecrow at Ace Chemicals. Then we spend the whole arc wondering who the Arkham Knight is and how he put together this militia before confronting Scarecrow for about 30 seconds, and he's gone. Then we spend forever trying to figure out who the Knight is, try to find Barbara, we confront Penguin, who tells us to go find Stag, we explore the airships a bit, Stag gets taken, we learn he worked for Scarecrow and helped develop his latest toxin, and oh, here he is! We're, we're finally confronting Scarecrow! Uh, oh, and now he's gone again. Oh, but he just killed Barbara, that's a great scene! Uh, uh, oh, we're just gonna forget that even happened until we see Barbara alive later. Cool. Then we go get Ivy, do some gardening, open up Founders Island, do the whole movie studio subplot, then the cloudburst goes off. Scarecrow's plan worked! Oh, he just spends the whole City of Fear segment sitting on his ass, casually monologuing to Batman as he navigates the tunnels, then ends up bitching for a bit at Batman for ruining his plans. Cool. Then we go through the night HQ, fight Jason, and we finally get that great confrontation in the rooftop, and then he, he's gone again. He sends the militia to wreck Barbara's work and destroy the GCPD, then he kidnaps Robin off screen, and we go to the admittedly masterful finale. I pretty much just explained the whole plot of Arkham Knight, and did you notice how little Scarecrow is actually in it? See, it's weird to talk about Scarecrow in Arkham Knight because there's so little to talk about. And that's ultimately the problem. Remember that one amazing scene on Hugo Strange? There's no compilation video, but I'd estimate Strange probably has less than 10 minutes of total screen time in Arkham City, even including the Catwoman DLC. Meaning, he probably has even less time than Scarecrow does relative to his game's length. And yet, he still made such a big impact. Strange had stuff to talk about with his limited screen time, whereas Scarecrow just doesn't. I was able to pull important meaning and character information out of a single line of dialogue from Strange. I can't really do that with anything from Scarecrow. His scenes are all great, but aside from the finale, what do they really mean? Oh, Batman's afraid and he's breaking. Yeah, we can see that through other more subtle storytelling beats. <coughs> Joker. <coughs> We don't need Scarecrow telling us that Batman is breaking, we can clearly see it. It's all really unfortunate, because Scarecrow is such an interesting villain to explore, and they just completely shafted him in every respect. Who are you? You really have no idea. Do you? 
Bruce. There's a lot to unpack with Jason. I'll be the one to say it. I like the idea of Jason, Todd, and the Arkham Knight. I think it works very well for the story they wanted to tell. It creates some emotional moments not really present in previous games aside from Origins, and it does something unique with the character of Jason Todd. However, the twist execution does not work well at all. It's one thing that anyone who knows anything about Batman media knew the knight was Jason from the first trailer. That's hardly the designer's fault that they were adapting such a well-known piece of Batman lore. But it's another when the game literally spells it out multiple times that the knight will be Jason Todd. Now, I understand why they did these nightmare scenes. There's always a chance that a player is very new to Batman and has no idea who Jason Todd is. Heck, I was one of those people the first time I played Knight. Especially considering the most attention they've given him in the series so far was an offhand remark by Joker in a DLC challenge map where you had to play as Robin. And I'm pretty sure it only had a chance of actually appearing anyway. What? Didn't I kill you already? No? Well, there's always time, right? Aside from that one throwaway line, Jason had never appeared in the Arkham Saga. Yes, that includes Origins, that's on me for saying that Robin in Origins Online was Jason, it's actually Dick, my bad. Anyway, back on track, I do understand why they needed to go through with all this Jason stuff if they were going to introduce him as this sudden twist villain. The problem is that going this route completely derails the twist. It's very difficult to pull off a twist the audience knows that a character does not, and it's pretty much impossible when you're playing as that character that doesn't know the twist. I can think of a few film examples where the audience knows a twist before a character, and yet it still works because of how it affects said characters. Ones that immediately come to mind are Far From Home, Your Next, and Inglorious Bastards. And if you know anything about those movies, you probably know what I'm talking about for each. I can't think of a single instance of a game where the audience knows something their player character doesn't, unless you're in a scenario where you can control multiple characters like GTA V or The Last of Us. But since we only control Batman, and occasionally Robin and Nightwing in Arkham Knight, we only have one perspective to look through. We the audience can see the twist coming because we aren't in the same scenario as Batman, who genuinely thinks Jason is dead. We didn't go through the same grief he did, so seeing his surrogate son alive again after getting hallucinations of him barely hours before doesn't affect us like it does him. Ultimately the problem is the limited perspective. Since the player is expected to know everything Batman knows and nothing else, a twist like this simply can't work. With no outside perspective to make us canonically more knowing than the protagonists, this twist cannot work like the devs intended. I appreciate what they were going for, really I do. And again, I think Jason as the Knight was a great move that provided a lot of great character moments. Just see his interview tapes and boss fight, it's got some emotional stuff. Joker did, Barbara. He hollowed me out and filled me back up with hate. The problem is how they tried going about the twist. If I were to change this in any way, I'd actually make it so Batman lured to Jason almost immediately. We can have some tension building during Ace as Batman starts to see what he's capable of, but I think when Jason confronts him directly in this scene behind the glass, he should reveal himself and let that toy with Bruce's mind. This would break Batman far more than just some anonymous guy who supposedly knows everything about him. He would see someone who he thought was dead for years, suddenly alive and well standing right in front of him, with an army by his side ready to kill. Combine that reveal with the hallucination sequences we already got to show how much losing Jason affected Batman over the years, while simultaneously introducing Jason to all the new players who don't know his story, and you have a much more compelling story than the one we got. There would be no mystery as to who this man is and how he's able to always stay one step ahead of Batman. We would know why and how this is possible, but it would be Batman's inner conflict with seeing this play out that would be the big twist. He sees someone he thought of as a son, who he thought was dead, suddenly back and using all his knowledge to try to kill him. He'd know how Jason was the one to kidnap Oracle, and instead of wondering who and how, he'd be wondering why why Jason is the one to do it. And if Jason was willing to kidnap Barbara, someone who couldn't have helped him like Batman could, what is he going to do to her? Was he really willing to kill her over Bruce's failure? Is that how far he's fallen? Hey, question. Did it hurt? Watching her die. How did you anything? 
and it would make their final confrontation when Jason reveals what he's been feeling all these years all the more impactful. Instead of the lackluster, who are you, before his fight, we could instead get a why. Why, Jason? Why go through all this just to kill Bruce? And more than anything, it would subvert basically everyone's expectations after seeing the marketing for this game. Everyone expects the knight to be this mysterious figure who they build up the entire game for a twist reveal, only to be blindsided by learning his identity almost immediately. If you've seen Knives Out, you know this kind of subversion works damn well. And I don't see why it wouldn't work here as well. I'm sure there's a piece of Batman media that already explores this idea that I've just never seen, and you're all gonna yell at me for not knowing in the comments. But regardless of if that's the case, I think this small change would make a game called Arkham Knight a lot more about the knight himself. Let me know what you think of this change, as well as what mistakes you think I missed in the comments. I'd really like to know. All that said, I still absolutely love Arkham Knight, but its shortcomings are becoming a lot more glaring the more time I spend with it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later, chaps. You get to see how it ends.